transport mechanisms. Okay, let's take a look at the first mechanism and that is diffusion. Before we do that we need to talk about some terms as well. We need to talk about what a solute, a solvent and a solution are. A solute is simply an ion or molecule that's dissolved in a solvent, often water. In fact, in the case of our course, we're pretty much just going to talk about water as being the solvent. So if you take a look at this example and we assume that the blue material is water, the solute is going to be this red material. And you can see that there is a concentration gradient initially. This would be the equivalent of dumping a spoonful of salt into water. And initially, the salt is all in one location. But because these particles are all moving uh, due to their natural movement, eventually those salt particles will spread out. Now, in which one of these, A or B, do you have a concentration gradient? Well, the answer is A, because there's a difference. Over here, there's a lot of the salt, and over here, there's hardly any, or there is none. At the end of the process that occurs, these particles bumping into each other randomly, what you'll have is a homogeneous solution, where you have an even distribution of solute within the solvent. So, for example, if you were to taste the water in B, you'd find that it's equally salty over here as it is over here. But if you tried to do the same with A, you'd find that this area is incredibly salty and this area is not salty at all. So B is the homogeneous solution. Some features of diffusion are that basically it occurs until dynamic equilibrium is reached, until you have a homogeneous solution, if you use the example we just looked at. It's not affected by the gradients of other substances. So in this little animation, you can see that the red and the blue particles are spreading out randomly and how far apart the red particles end up is not affected by how far apart the blue particles spread out. They're all kind of going about their own business as though the other one doesn't even exist and they each are following their own concentration gradient. The rate at which they move around is dependent on temperature. So if you give them some extra heat energy they will move faster and diffusion will occur more quickly. The concentration gradient also is a factor. If you have a greater difference of concentration like we did in this example, a diffusion is going to occur faster. So initially when you dump the salt in, diffusion is going to occur very quickly. But as those particles spread out, the rate of diffusion actually will decrease. The final rate dependent feature is the size of the molecules. Smaller molecules will diffuse faster than larger molecules simply because they can go a greater distance before they have a collision with another molecule. Now diffusion is relevant to biology because it can occur across a selectively permeable membrane and in fact oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse freely through the phospholipid bilayer and that's how they get into and out of cells. So if we put a membrane there, we can see that these particles are behaving a lot like oxygen and carbon dioxide where there is actually no barrier to their movement from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. So here we have another example that shows the process of diffusion across a membrane. If we have a very salty solution, let's say this solution relative to a less salty solution, we'll see that if we give it enough time, assuming that these particles can actually fit through the membrane, you're going to have more particles crossing over to this side than you'll have crossing over to this side simply because there's more of them to begin with and they're more likely to have collisions with that membrane and actually fit through the pores. And eventually you'll reach what we call dynamic equilibrium and there will no longer be a concentration gradient across that membrane. On this side there is a concentration gradient. Let's take a look at another passive process, osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane and it features the movement from an area of high concentration of water to an area of low concentration of water. So you may be wondering how this can work. We'll see in a minute. It also features a total solute concentration that determines the direction of osmosis. Regardless of the type of solutes present, their total is going to basically determine the direction of osmosis. And we need to talk about a few terms in order to make this make sense. A solution which has a higher solute concentration than another one is considered to be hypertonic. So in this case, Solution A is hypertonic to solution B. 
So we say that solution B is hypotonic to solution A because a hypotonic solution has a lower solute concentration of dissolved solutes relative to another solution. You can't use these terms on their own. You can't just say, well, solution A is hypertonic or solution B is hypotonic. Compared to what? These terms are comparative terms. So if you use the term hypotonic or hypertonic in a sentence, you also have to use the word to to show that you're comparing it to something. Now, if you have another solution, assuming these are all of the same volume, we'll call this solution C, you can see that solution C has the same number of solutes dissolved into the water as solution B. And so we would say that these two solutions are isotonic to each other, meaning that they have the same or equal solute concentration relative to one another. So let's take a look at some features of osmosis. If you have two solutions and one solution has a higher solute concentration than the other, doesn't matter what kind of solutes they are, we're talking about total solute concentration. This could be things like, if we were talking about living cells, it could be things like ions, large macromolecules, it could even th be things like blood cells or any other type of cells. So if one side has a higher concentration of these materials than the other side, and we start with equal volumes and we assume that these materials are dissolved in water, the water will actually move through the membrane from an area of where the water is in high concentration to where the water concentration is low. And it's kind of weird to wrap your brain around this to think about the higher concentration of water versus the, the lower concentration of water. But if you think about it this way, if this is one milliliter of water that you're comparing to one milliliter over here, which one actually has more water molecules in it? Well, it's the same volume and we've got other things dissolved in the water. That would have to mean that we actually have a higher volume of water over here than we do over here. So we have a higher concentration of water on the left side, A, than we do on B. So since there's a higher concentration of water on the left side in A, it should actually move to where it's in lower concentration, which is B. So we get this movement of water across this membrane and what we end up with is sort of an attempt to try to dilute this material and then of course this material becomes more concentrated as a result. And so basically nature is sort of moving towards equilibrium. Whether it actually gets there or not in this type of a situation outside of a cell where gravity might be an issue, uh, it may not actually happen but you will get movement to some extent. Within a living cell, you probably come a lot closer. So how does osmosis work? Take a look at solutions A and B and look at the legend as well. Water is the open circle and the solute is the closed in circle. If you take a look at these two solutions, which one has a higher concentration of water, assuming that they both have the same volume? If you take a look at solution A and B, you'll see that solution B has more solutes dissolved within it and as a result, we're going to call solution A hypotonic to solution B. So in this case, if A is hypotonic to B, we should notice a movement of water towards solution B. If we take a look at solution C and D, again separated by a water permeable membrane, we can try to determine which direction the water might go. And you're going to have to look at the actual total number of each type of particle once again. In this case, C is isotonic to D and D is isotonic to C, so we should see no net movement of water. That doesn't mean we have no movement of water at all because the water is still moving, those particles are still moving. Just because they're at equilibrium, it doesn't mean that they stop moving. It's just that for every molecule of water that crosses over from C to D, another one is going to cross over from D to C. In this YouTube experiment, you see something very similar to what we just looked at. Assuming uh, we have water and dissolved salts in this YouTube and that there is a semi-permeable membrane separating both sides, we'll take a look at A and we'll see that side A over here is hypertonic to side B. We're not actually showing the water molecules here, we're just showing the solute dissolved in the water and we're starting with the same volume. So given that, we can safely say that there is less water over here and there is more water over here. 
and as a result the water should move from an area of higher concentration of water where there's more of it to an area of lower concentration of water so it should move in this direction and over time we see that the final state of the U-tube here demonstrates that and basically we've now reached equilibrium where we have equal concentrations of solute dissolved in the solvent water on each side of the semi-permeable membrane. Okay, let's take a look at how osmosis affects cells. Once again, we're not going to draw the water in, we'll just draw the solutes in. The ideal situation for animal cells is to be in a solution that is isotonic to the inside of the cells. And if we take a look at this red blood cell, we'll see that if there are solutes in the same concentration outside as there are inside, or the solution outside is isotonic to the solution inside, we get an equal movement of water out as we get in, and the cell remains healthy and it has a certain turgidity. However, if we take those same cells and put them into a situation where the outside has a greater concentration of solutes than the inside, that is, we put it into a hypertonic solution, the water will leave the cell and the cell will shrivel up and become flaccid. If we do the opposite, if we put the cells into a hypotonic solution where there aren't that many solutes relative to the number of solutes inside the cell, water will flow in and the cell membrane won't be able to contain all that water and basically will get cell lysis or cell breakage. Now what happens for um, animal cells also happens for plant cells. However, the isotonic solution is not the ideal for plant cells. In fact, the hypotonic situation is ideal and here's why. We can agree that the hypertonic situation where you have more solutes outside than inside is actually not going to benefit the cell because water will leave it and all living things need water for their cellular functions and reactions. However, an isotonic solution isn't really ideal for plants either because yes you have equal amount of water leaving as you have coming in, but plants actually rely on turgidity or being very full and firm because that allows them to press against the cell walls and multiply that by a few million cells inside of a plant and what you're going to see is that it helps the plant remain rigid and upright because the cell wall is very strong and rigid being made of cellulose and plants don't have a skeleton the way we do and so they rely on this to maintain their rigidity. The ideal situation for them is to keep them not overwatered but well watered so that the cells are actually taking on water and they would be doing this if you have a situation where there is a lot of water outside of the cells and not as much inside and so it fills up this water vacuole so it's nice and full and it allows the whole cell to push up against the cell wall and it keeps your plant from wilting. But in a situation where you have trigger pressure the plant is nice and upright the last type of passive transport that we'll talk about is facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is the diffusion of solutes across a membrane with the help of carrier proteins. Now the movement is still from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration which means that it requires no extra energy, no ATP. So this is why it's still passive transport. It occurs because sometimes diffusion isn't fast enough to get the desired particles into a cell and it aids the diffusion of many polar molecules and ions that are impeded by a membrane's phospholipid bilayer. So there might be a lot of them outside the cell, but they can't get in through the phospholipid bilayer, and so they have to have a way to get in. There's two different ways that materials can move in. One of them is via translocation, which is shown on the right-hand side here, where a particular particle fits into a space on a particular protein uh, that's a carrier protein embedded in the cell membrane and as that membrane changes conformations from one shape to the other it actually expels that particle on the other side of the membrane so it enters here the whole carrier protein changes its shape and as a result these, this particle is actually transferred to the other side of the membrane. This occurs very quickly and in fact this is the way that glucose enters the cell and it's very quick for each one of these carrier molecules it can do this about a hundred times a second. The other way that particles can move in through facilitated diffusion is through selective channels and these are protein carriers that are hydrophilic and specific. The gates open only in response to electrical or chemical stimuli so this channel would only be opened up 
if there was a stimulus for it to be open otherwise it would be closed and it would prevent these particles from entering and the reason it might open up would be through various cell communication methods such as the binding of a neurotransmitter to nerve cells which opens gated channels so that a particle like sodium can pass and we talk about this more when we get to the nervous system okay so in summary we've looked at three different forms of passive transport we've looked at diffusion we've talked about osmosis and the third mechanism we looked at was facilitated transport 